Hi, today I'm going to be talking to you about a way that I found to cope with stress and trauma. College, while of course a time of immense opportunity, is also a time of substantial emotional and physical stress. We are faced with needing to deal with large amounts of intellectually demanding work, the responsibilities of living away from home, dealing with girls, dealing with boys, sleep and lack thereof in my case, weather that is so cold it's personally offensive, and all, all the while we're expected to be making decisions that will affect the rest of our lives. We are the recipients of a large influx of information. For example, in the same week that I was learning the basics of microbiology, I was also learning that turning your sheets inside out is almost like washing them. <laughs> almost. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> I can't stress the amount of stress that we as college students face. And it's even worse when something happens. You might not all know that the first six weeks of college are called the red zone for freshman girls. It's when sexual assault is most likely to take place. I am a freshman girl, and for me, it was at my fourth week at Notre Dame that I was hospitalized for sexual assault and battery. In searching for a way to cope with this trauma and also settle into a new hectic life that was thousands, away, thousands of miles away from my home. I began to realize the way in which our interests and hobbies and passions are all attempts at catharsis. In addition to the standard outlets like reading and writing and art, my generation in particular exhibits some of the more visible coping mechanisms such as tattooing, that being a picture of me in a great deal of pain, <laughs> Experimentation with physical appearance, such as in the dyeing of hair, or piercings, or clothing, music, and exercise. Bless you. What these things all have in common are that they present an exploration of self. But why, why is this cathartic? It's because it's freeing to open oneself up to new ways of identifying and defining oneself. It is empowering to exert your own autonomy in deciding to maybe dye your hair to, to embody a new chapter in your life, or even channel your anxieties into the study of yoga. For me personally, I was dealing with a sense of dissociation after what happened to me. I also had to rebuild a fundamental sense of trust in other human beings that beforehand I had taken completely for granted. For example, walking down the street and passing another person became an activity that demanded my entire attention. Class was uncomfortable and crowds were paralyzing. It, this was obviously very draining for me. I, so I needed a way of releasing this tension, recognizing the new raw emotions that I was feeling, and also rebuilding that fundament, fundamental sense of trust in others. And I was able to do this primarily through photography. And this was a natural choice for me because I grew up loving photography. But there was also another reason why it was important that I made an effort to regularly photograph. And this was that when I was assaulted, there were people present who were photographing me while it happened. And I knew it would be easy to shy away from having my picture taken after I'd been photographed at my most vulnerable and against my will. But I, I did not want my love of photography to be taken from me because of this. And so, in this way, I was able to heal by reclaiming for myself my own vulnerability. A portrait allows vulnerability to be captured and then dissected and studied. And the ability to control how and when I'm vulnerable makes me feel powerful. So I came to this on my own, but a quick Google search will show that the practice of therapeutic photography actually already exists and is defined as self-conducted portraits of both oneself and others as a means of reflecting and healing. It works in practice because it is a simple, highly accessible medium, especially in today's culture, and even more so among my generation, because we are steeped in technology and actually already view it as an outlet for emotion, which you all will know if you've ever seen a melodramatic teenage Facebook status. But ph the photography itself is effective because we are highly visual creatures, and photography is, of course, a visual medium. We are able to use what is arguably our strongest sense as a means of channeling emotion without requiring great artistic talent or vision, but simply the possession of a face and maybe someone else's face and a camera and a functioning index finger. And it is good that it's available to us because uh, we are at an age when we're faced with many challenges. 
The National College Health Association reported that a quarter of college students a year feel reportedly unable to function multiple times a year due to various stressors. This points to a large portion of a demographic that is in need of some form of an outlet. The therapeutic photography works because you're able to look at yourself and others in a removed manner. And this outside perspective allows the ability of seeing emotions and expressions and postures that you would have otherwise missed. You can recognize your own indiv individuality, and say, also say that word maybe, and beauty. And you're also able to take and view these photographs, and these serve as a catalyst to emotions, which help to deepen insight and evoke meaning. For me personally, having been always possessed by a slightly manic and creepy need to catalog, it allowed me a medium through which I could tangibly box up emotions and memories into organizable folders. It also gave me another medium through which I could edit these photos in an attempt of exactly mirroring the emotions driving their creation. Therapeutic photography can address all these specific needs, but is still generalized enough that it can apply to any number of afflictions ranging from eating and body dysmorphic disorders to depression to loss to my own recovery. And it's my own healing that, that demonstrates how therapeutic photography can be easily individualized. On days that I woke up and I felt like my body was tainted and foreign to me, I took pictures of myself until it was familiarized again to me. It took taking these pictures and recognizing myself in them to begin to reconcile myself with my body. It took studying pictures and noticing the bags under my eyes and the lost weight that I'd otherwise overlooked to begin to really heal my body itself. I, seeing my own day-to-day -day expressions gave a face and a label to these new troubling and confusing emotions I was feeling and also let me see what other people was, were seeing in me during my recovery. And this kind of awakening and new awareness was invaluable. So getting into the specifics of how uh, therapeutic photography works, I have found various ways of capturing vulnerability in photographs. It can't really be found in staged, quote unquote, pretty photos, such as in this photo of my, my beautiful family. Uh, this photo is very um, general, and you can't really glean much about our personalities. All you can really tell is that maybe bad eyesight is genetic. <laughs> um, <laughs> Whereas, prepare for this one. This photo, while not as pretty as the first, does say a lot about the personalities of the, of the people pictured. And even outside of a therapeutic sense, these unplanned, unpost photos are more meaningful. And I promise I won't ever make you look at that photo ever again. <laughs> it is pictures that elicit a reaction like this one that are saved onto our hard drives and passed down in photo albums. If anything, I hope I can influence the way in which you choose to photograph your friends and family from now on. And so getting back into the specifics, um, on opposite si it's on opposite sides of a spectrum that vulnerability can, can be found in either not knowing your picture is being taken, and that's called candid photography, and in being hyper aware that your photo is being taken, which is called close-up photography. Candid photography such as in this picture of me being weird, um, it reveals vulnerability in that the subject does not know that they're being watched. So they're acting in the way that they would naturally. When we know that we're being watched, you, you put up a couple fronts. You, you fix your posture and you tilt your chin and you employ rehearsed, re rehearsed expressions that you wouldn't genuinely use to convey joy or sorrow, such as my friend here. And in this way, you can glean a lot about someone from seeing them laughing or lost in thought. In short, in candid photography, you're able to capture their essence. On the other end of the spectrum are close-up portraits. In close-up portraits, you can't hide behind ideal distance and angling. You're looking into the camera with no barriers, knowing it's picking up every detail of your face. The results are powerful because the close zoom creates a sense of intimacy. You are viewing the subject, in effect, from a closeness that they are normally only viewed by close friends and family in. And that is how it functions. So, in learning about the value of vulnerability in therapeutic photography, it caused me to examine the broader importance of vulnerability in my everyday life. 
We live in a world of fronts and facades where we overemphasize stoicism and stigmatize emotion down to the expected response of doing well when asked, how are you? It took familiarizing and accustoming myself to vulnerability to learn to not repress its natural presence in my life. And in doing so, I was able to eliminate the exhaustive task of putting up a front in public and also afforded others a genuineness that they could hopefully relate to in, in healing from their own stress and trauma. There is a paradoxical nature to the strength that can be found in vulnerability. It took strength for me to do therapeutic photography. It, it was hard, but it became empowering. In this way, it's both a means to and a source of strength. So I make everyday efforts to incorporate vulnerability into m my life. I try to make myself a vulnerable person, and in doing so, I derive strength, especially in, in giving a talk about something that is highly personal and prior to a few minutes ago, only known to those closest to me. I, I'm making myself completely vulnerable to you, but in doing so, I have found both strength and a platform to share that which I've learned. And so thank you for that.